Hello and welcome to the Viag World Show where we look at user experience design, conversion optimization and working in the web. In this week's show we're going to look at an alternative to Figma's rather sucky prototyping abilities, why we need to simplify our copy and why so many UX leaders are set up to fail. So that's cheerful. Well, it's, it's quite uncheerful in our house as well. Michelle's got COVID what? and she's all grumpy. Oh. <laughs> so, and I've, but I've managed to avoid it again. I think that's one of the reasons why she why she's grumpy. <laughs> yeah, well, almost certainly. Perhaps you're one of those, what do they, carrier patients? Oh, okay, yes, people. basically. I've got it yeah. all the time and you would never know. No, I did feel very, yeah. I felt absolutely drained earlier. On. Here we go. But now I woke up yesterday and thought, yeah, I'm all right. And I'm still all right today. So hurrah. That, that the absolutely drained thing probably was just being your age. Well, we're, 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 n- we're now at that age, aren't we, really? It's quite funny because I often go to bed feeling very sort of like, oh, I've not had anything to drink and I've eaten healthy food. And I wake up in the morning aching and feeling like shit. I think it might as well just get drunk and be hung over. <laughs> Very wise, very wise. So, so, where um, are you at the moment, yeah. Paul? Come on, tell me, where are you? I'm on the Oregon coast at the moment. Oh, well. Um, that's where Michelle's is, brothers live. That's where she was no, out earlier in, in the year. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of them lives on the coast, the other one lives inland a bit, where it's all kind of very sort of big country and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful area. So today, obviously, because we're in such a beautiful area, my wife is taking me to a cheese factory. Factory? T- well, what, the shop yeah. at the cheese factory, fair enough. No, no, <laughs> no, no. The, the tour of the factory itself, she's giving me daggers at the moment, looks <laughs> that could kill. <laughs> so, yeah, apparently that's what I'm doing today. But I, who who knows? It might turn out to be really good. Yesterday, she had me in an alpaca farm, which was, they're so cute. I oh, want an alpaca oh. now. So you can, there we People go. do have them as pets. I think you need quite they a do. decent garden. And not go yeah. away for half the year. Yeah. And also not to have artificial grass in your garden because you're away for half the year. They wouldn't have much to eat, would they, <laughs> no, really? No. So there we go. So, um... Yeah, I I wanted to very briefly talk about a really interesting video that I've watched. Um, have you have you heard of Chloe Abram? Is that a name that rings a bell with you? Probably not. Is that the woman she on the don't... video that I started to watch of, with, yes. Mark, with Mark Zuckerberg? Although yes. I'm convinced you... that's not Mark Zuckerberg in that video. Why? Why is that? It just doesn't look quite right. It's like it's like the but whole that, thing has been made by AI. Woo. <laughs> but Mark Zuckerberg has always looked like that, even before just, there was AI. I'm watching it thinking, that's not him. It's not him. But anyway, I, but I, anyway I didn't watch all the videos, so you can explain to the viewers, the listeners, um, what it's all about. So, so if you haven't come across Chloe Abram, I highly recommend her channel. Um, that was a new format for her, which was just like a conversation. But she normally does these videos called uh, Huge, but it, Huge If True. And it's optimistic science and technology. All right. Okay. Um, and, and she's just brilliant. I love it. I love it. Basically, um, she talks about what impact technology and science might have, you know, what its potential is and that kind of stuff. But she started doing these these interviews. And her very first one was with Mark Zuckerberg. And I just found it really insightful as a um really into different people's mindsets it was fascinating because he drove me a bit around the twist and this isn't a criticism i've no idea whether mark zuckerberg is a nice man or a nasty man Uh, there are things that his companies have done that i don't particularly like but you know i don't know what his motivation was he's not elon but, musk or so it would no seem. he's not <laughs> no he's he, he doesn't come across as quite that kind of <laughs> um yeah but um but it was fascinating because it was like she was trying to ask him about um you know if your vision of the future comes about because you are one of the most powerful men in the world so there's a good chance that might happen what will life look be like? How will life be better? That was the fundamental principle of these will conversations. It be <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he he just didn't get it, right? His whole mindset 
because she, she would be, well, how is life going to be different? And he was going, answering things like, um, well, we'll all be wearing heads up displays and, and, you know, talking to AI and stuff. But what she was driving at is, well, how will it make my life better? Oh, well, you'll have heads up displays. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. isn't intrinsically better. So his whole mindset, which is so alien to me, was that you kind of create technology and the technology in itself is kind of the goal. It's almost like pure science. You know, when, you know, you, people go, well, why are we spending all that money on the Hydra and Collider, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or Higgs boson Collider or whatever it is. Um, you know, and, and the official answers are, well, you don't know what you'll discover. And that was kind of his attitude with technology, we, you know, We'll create it and then let's see, you know, it'll benefit humanity eventually. Maybe. I, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Um, from my perspective, it, it works the other way around. It's like you find a fundamental thing that humans want to do or, or a problem that they're facing. And then you look for a technology that can be applied to that problem. While he has the problem, he has the technology and says, what problems can it help solve? Which is a really different way of looking at it. That is a kind of pure scientist's way of looking at the world, though, isn't it, really? It's kind of like, well, yeah. this, this is interesting stuff, and then it might be useful. Or, yeah. Or the evil people will use it for war. My sci great scientific discovery. But he, he, he seemed like a genuine enough guy. It's just that he felt a little bit naive. About, I don't know. I don't know. It was a weird interview. Anyway, I wanted to mention it. As I said, it wasn't him. But no, it was Michelle. He's been, third Michelle mentioned. She, it was her birthday uh, a couple of days ago. And she's got the new Apple Watch, the Apple Watch 10. All right. And Ooh, you, you know what? I'm yeah, like. shiny. I'm, not, I'm like kind of about lots of things. But we were both yeah. said we are in the future at a couple of points. Yeah. When it was doing things to do with her health and, and messaging yeah. me about it and stuff. And it's like... So, yeah, some gadgets are good. And I do like the... And the, when you said the other day on one of the podcasts about the... Because uh, well, I was in the Apple Store, basically, looking at Apple Store stuff. And they have yes. the iVision or whatever it's called. Um, yeah. Um, You're really up on technology, aren't you, Marcus? But what struck me, I, I want one of those. I don't want that one because, as you said, it's too heavy and too, like, I'm wearing this massive headset. Yeah, yeah. But, but to get rid of all this clutter in front of me... Yeah, it's fantastic. Bring it on. Well, I tell you, the 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 other thing that um, uh, the reason Mark was on this video was that they just made loads of big announcements. One of the things that it showed off, I mean, it's not in production, but it was a kind of proof of concept thing that they've been doing, which was a much more normal pair of glasses, a bit like yours, but probably thicker. Yeah, yeah. Right. So they're they're quite chunky still, but that is that was like a Vision Pro esque kind of technology all reduced down into a big pair of glasses wow. so now now we're really getting somewhere now you know that that has got potential at the moment each one costs thousands and thousands <laughs> of pounds to produce yeah. so that they're, they're not going to do them yet but it was an interesting proof of concept cool so yeah it was a good it was good it was a very interesting interview with him and he had some really interesting ideas around um ai as well and, and about whether you should open source that um, and make it available to, to everybody or whether it should be controlled by a few companies. Now, obviously, he's pro open source because that's the method that they're using. But his logic behind that was quite interesting. And yeah, it's just a good interview. And I recommend people check it out. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to briefly mention, although we need to keep an eye on time, is um, I wanted to encourage people a bit because... I am seeing so much doom and gloom about the state of UX um, and design at the moment um, and in technology in just general. There's been huge numbers of layoffs um, uh, in, and a lot of people are losing their jobs at the moment. Um, and I know a lot of agencies that are struggling. You guys are doing all right, aren't you? I've been slow this year from a new business yeah. perspective, but we've got, right. we've been around for many years. We've got a lot of ongoing clients who continue to pay us to do things. So, and, it's, so it's been fun. And we, they're spending money. We, yeah, yeah. Um, some are more begrudgingly than others. Um, I would say I would say that yeah, budgets appear to be a bit tighter. Um, yeah, but 
this last month, I've been moaning about how many proposals I, I'm having to write. Obviously, that will come to nothing. But yeah. in August, I didn't write one proposal. Well, it's quite yeah. no- normal for August, but, you know. Yeah, that's not. Um, yeah. But that's a, the good news to a degree is that I am doing what I'm meant to be doing, or part of my role anyway, is writing proposals um, for new opportunities. So, and yes, I've, I've got three or four on the go at the moment, and that's more than normal. Um, so, so that's good. We're only a small agency. We don't need to, you know, we don't eat that much. We don't, you know, we've got that many mouths yeah. to feed. We don't need that much. Um, and it might be, we might be being lucky or, yeah, I don't know. But it, right now it's quite encouraging ask me in a month or two's time when I find out the results of where we've got. Oh, I, also, I suspect I would get a completely opposite answer if I asked Chris, because you could not be more diametric. You propose uh, <laughs> pose, um, in the way that you look at the world. But anyway, yeah, so there's, there's, there seems to be a bit of a, a down uh, on pe- uh, um, at the moment. I'm hearing it a lot um, from yeah. lots of people I coach and the rest of it. And I just wanted to say, look, it will pass... You know, these things come and go. And, you know, I, I think if you haven't lived through this multiple times, you begin to get a bit twitchy about it and you get a bit worried. We're not, and this isn't, this is just a kind of, it's not AI, right? We're not all being replaced by AI because the work we do is highly creative. It's highly strategic. AI, it doesn't do that kind of stuff very well, at least not at the moment. So... It's not that. It's not a permanent change. It's just a combination of the world's a bit sucky at the moment. We've got a couple of wars going on. That the, We're still kind of recovering from COVID economically, you know, all of those kinds of things. And also, we've just gone through another bit of a tech bubble where, you know, UX was trendy for a while and it's now falling out of fashion a little bit. It'll settle down, you know. So I just wanted to, I don't know. Thanks, Uncle Paul. I know it does sound a little bit kind of old man-ish. Oh, it'll all be all right in the end. It could all go horribly wrong. You know, it, it, we've nearly gone out of business twice in the last 10 years um, and we've managed to turn it around. But we've been through we've been through times where we've had to kind of cut salaries quite a lot uh, and let yeah. people go. Will you let me go for a start? No, no, no. You? Well, you know, <laughs> I've looked back since. But running an agency is bloody hard, basically. And, yeah. you know... It, You've got to be lucky um, and resilient uh, to keep going at it for as long as we have. And I appreciate the chances that we've been given. And I'm very much looking yeah. forward to not having to do it one day. I don't want to get all kind of hippie about it. But, you know, if, if things aren't meant to be, then go and do something else, basically. If you've got yeah. skills, you can put them somewhere else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And when I wrote about this, I, I really ought to put a link in the show notes, although no doubt I'll forget. I, I I said, look, you know, if if you've been laid off, it might be that you'll need to get a job with an agency where you've traditionally worked in house. It might be that if you traditionally worked in house, you need to go, you know, or traditionally worked in an agency. Or, yeah, yeah, the other way around. The only people I think, if you're very new to the sector, I think you might struggle a little bit for a while. Um, and, you know... I, I, uh, and that's okay. It might be that you have to work in a related sector for a while until the sector recovers or, or, or whatever. But so yeah, go and do something else. It's the equivalent. But yeah, whether you're if you're if you're struggling at the moment, I would say keep at it. It will pass. It's just a sucky time. Anyway, we ought to move on because we're going to run out of time. Yep. So. I wanted to share a few little um, apps this week. It could be a bit of a quick fire one because um, I always like to share apps with you. Exactly, that's me. The first <laughs> one is I am sick of, of yeah you know, Figma. Figma is great. Um, I love Figma. Um, it does a lot of things very well. I'm very excited about some of the updates that are coming to it. Um, that you know, and I like the new interface and all the rest of it. But there's one thing that they have just utterly failed to fix for a long, long time, and I'm sick of it, which is their their prototyping builder thing. It is the buggiest pile of poo I have ever come across. <laughs> um, and, and, and you know, every every app has its weakness, and with Figma, it is its prototyping ability. I, it just doesn't... What? Well, it is buggy, but also there's certain things it just doesn't do. It doesn't offer breakpoints, 
Um, you can do responsiveness, but you can't say, okay, I, you know, at this width, I suddenly want to, you know, switch to a mobile version. There are workarounds to this kind of stuff, but don't give me that crap. It needs to be built in properly. So it doesn't do that. And the other, and the most important thing it doesn't do from my point of view is, is full fields. You'd think that'd be the like fundamental thing. You should be able to select something and say, I want this to be a form field so that you can do user testing on it. Because what's the point of prototyping if you can't use a test something like as basic as data entry? That's what it's for. So, yeah, exactly. Why, why else are you prototyping if not to do that kind of stuff? So it, it kind of sucks. Um, I, you don't, if you love Figma, don't bother emailing me. I don't care that you think it's great. I know it <laughs> sucks. Um, so... But there is another tool that, that I tend to use if I want to get a decent prototype, which is a tool called Framer. Now, it's a bit weird. They've done a weird thing. It started off by being a kind of competitor with Figma, um, but then they turned it into, they're now calling it a web builder, so you can build entire websites in it. Yeah, great. That's wonderful if you're talking about little websites that, that don't, you know, need to be particularly optimized or anything like that. I wouldn't use it particularly to build a proper website, um, although now I get Framer people uh, criticizing yeah. me as well, I suspect. But um, but I do use it a lot for creating high-fidelity prototypes because you can do things like form fields and stuff like that. So really, that's, that's all I wanted to say on that one. Um, if you find yourself in that frustrating position of banging up against the edge of, of Figma's uh, prototyping abilities, Check out Framer. You can even take your Figma files straight into Framer. Um, so you could still, it's not like you have to design everything in Framer from scratch, or they can do if you want to. So that's that one. Okay. Um, second tool I wanted to mention um, is a, a, a little tool that has become possibly the tool I use, the app I use most regularly on my computer. Um, mm. And it's called fixkey.ai. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know whether you've seen, but in the new versions of um, the Mac OS, it's introducing writing tools into it, AI-driven writing tools, where you could select a piece of text and you can proofread it or whatever else, right? Well, fixed key is that on steroids, okay? So what you can do is um, you can write a, a sentence and then you can hit a keyboard, you select the sentence or paragraph, or entire post, doesn't matter how long it is, um, you hit a keyboard shortcut, and then you, that will run any number of prompts that you want, and you can edit those prompts. So just by way of example, I have got prompts that says, fix the grammar, right? Just don't change any of the writing style, but just fix the grammar. Right. Or I've got another one that says, um, improve the writing generally. Or another one that says, make it clear and concise. Another one that says, summarize it for me. Um, tight, turn it into title case, make it shorter, make it bullet points, all of these kinds of things. And you, what is so powerful about this is that you can go in and edit those prompts to give you exactly what you want. So when I say, for example, improve the writing, I've actually gone in and said, but you know, and really emphasize, don't change the tone of voice because it's got this tendency, as a lot of these things have, of going into that generic AI speak that it does. Um, and it's just brilliant because now I can type, you know, don't worry about it. The, the most valuable thing is I just, I don't correct typos anymore. I don't worry about whether it's put the wrong word in. I just type as fast as I possibly can, select the whole lot and go fix the grammar and it goes through and go, now you, it, that's auto corrected to with, and it was supposed to be this word instead. And it just fixes it. And it's just incredibly valuable and incredibly fast to, to turn stuff around. I think, I think even you, Marcus, would even like this me. Tool. Okay. Even you, yeah, I, you Luddite. I just playing a role. I know you are. <laughs> I do know you are. I know you. I You're do take notice of, your, of these things, particularly at Framer. That we've we've been doing HTML wireframes for yonks, really. Um, but then I know Lee in particular has been trying other things out and moaning about them. So I'll get him to have a look at that one. 
Um, and I will I will have a look at the one that you just said that I can't remember the name of. It's called Fix Key. Fix, Fix Key. Key. Dot AI. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, it basically you hit a key and it fixes everything. It's wonderful. Wow. Right. Here's one you're going to be a bit more cynical of. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, uh, chat, chat, back to chat GPT, right? Okay. I use um, chat GPT. Have you come across the, have you seen this new advanced voice feature? No, I have not. That's come out. Right. So it's literally just, okay, if you use the pro account, you'd have to pay $20 a month or whatever it is. Um, it, it's got the most natural sounding voice interaction you will ever have. You just can't tell it's not a human, really. Um, and it puts emotion into it and it puts, um, you know, you could even say, you know, speak to me in a Scottish accent. And it'll do a terrible <laughs> Scottish accent, you know, just like a person would. And it ums and oz and all the rest of it. All, all of that is gimmickry, right? But there is something... Because this is such a natural sounding voice now, I basically just leave it running the whole time. It's become like having a person I can bounce ideas around with. So, so one of the jobs that I hate the most is creating slide decks for workshops, right? Yeah. I, I, I love workshopping, you know, I, and, but I hate creating the slide decks. And my brain always freezes and I kind of get uh, fed up with this. So I was working on this yesterday and I just kept chat GPT open so I can have a voice conversation with it. And I was go and I literally explained what I was doing um, and said, I j you just need some help with it. And, and then I'll go, right. Okay. I like the idea of doing something that's like a discovery phase, but um, is, you know, appeals more to management, how, you know, how can we present this to management? I was thinking maybe it needs to cover these kinds of things, but I'm not really sure, you know, what are your thoughts on it? And it just starts talking back to me and I can interrupt and go, yeah, that isn't quite what I had in mind. But then I was wondering about, you know, doing this and doing that and, you know, oh yeah, no, that's a good idea. And it replies to me and I have this completely natural conversation with it. And for me, as somebody that works by myself a lot of the time, just having that prompt, that other person, and I, it came up with this stupid thing because I was thinking, you know, I don't want to call it a discovery phase because nobody knows what, you know, a discovery phase is. And, and they're like, oh, so I have to pay you money in order for you to tell me that, you know, for you to learn shit. Nobody ever wants to do that, right? So... I was thinking, how can we represent this to management? It, is, it came up with, and I, I, I like this, I'm afraid, super, S-U-P-A, the Strategic User-Driven Project Assessment, right? And it, it mm. came up with this whole way, I, I, I really <laughs> like it. I, I, know it's, mm. I know it's as corny, I, it's as corny as shit. It did give me other more boring ones, but I went with this one anyway because I just loved it. Um, but it really thought through a way of, you know, how could you present this? And just having somebody to brainstorm with, that's all it is. It's like artificially having a person to brainstorm. You look very unconvinced, Marcus. My question before you said that is, did it provide you with anything of any use? And in your mind, yes. Okay, that may be not, <laughs> that may be a bit of a tacky example for you, but it really did. Um, Sorry, say it again. You know, for, Go through the, what, what's the, uh, the acronym again? Super, S-U-P-A. Right. Right, a strategic user-driven project assessment. So it's a way of assessing whether something's worth doing or not. Yes, it's basically a discovery phase from another, you know, from another um, uh, angle perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah. But what it did go, what it went on to do is explain, you know, because I was like, well, I'm a bit worried this is going to overlap with what a business analyst does. Right. And that these organizations are going, oh, no, we don't need to do that because, you know, a business analyst does that. And she said, yeah, uh, yeah, there might be a bit of overlap there, but you could present it this way and that's how you could get and it was giving me really good advice and it's not that I always agreed with it right just like you would have probably not agreed with me over super um but I could say no nah, I don't think that quite feels right and it would then go well what about if you did it like this instead and it, it was just it's it's not that it it's not about it giving you the answers it's just having some 
pattern to Paul. bounce that off with. You're living in the future. You're living in a science fiction film. You are talking I'm to really your computer. Am. You may as well be on a spaceship. Just you. Yeah. And you're talking. Hey, computer. This, you're yeah. there. You are already there. I am. So basically, you have to get the pro account for me to have a friend. Is that, is that how it works? <laughs> yes. But yes, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Cool, but fair. It, it, it really is. You ought to, I, 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 I nearly was going to get her on the show and get her involved in this, but I didn't, I didn't know. I, I chickened out at the last minute. Anyway, we really must need to move. We've been talking for 30 minutes and we're still on the, the, the apps. Let's move on. Yeah, okay. Interestingly, what I was working on, that slide deck I was working on, was a new workshop on uh, design leadership, which by the time this comes out will have already run. Um, so this isn't a big promotion for the workshop, honestly. Um, but I'm really getting into this this subject of design leadership um, because I think it's an area where there's a really big need at the moment. And there's a lot of people that have been thrust into this design leadership role. And I think in a lot of cases have been set up to fail. And I think that's part of the problem that we're seeing going on in the industry at the moment. That, you know, there was lots and lots of investment in UX because everybody was saying, oh, UX is great. Apple have invested in UX and look how well they've done, right? So all these business leaders have gone, oh, yeah, UX is the trendy thing at the moment. We'll, we'll invest in it. And then, but they didn't do it right. Um, and so now UX is failing in their eyes, not producing a return on investment. And so they're all pulling their money from it. But the thing is, is I think that UX teams were set up to fail a lot of the time, and especially the UX leaders um, uh, within those teams. They're just not given the resources to address the scale of the UX that needs to be done within organizations. And I think we've had a conversation about this before, and we mark us about how I, I tend to work on the assumption that you need one UX person for every two developers that you've got. And I mm. think I remember you saying... You see it as a one-to-one -one relationship, which is even more extreme than me, mm. you know. So Certainly from a project perspective, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, oftentimes you'll find that companies have got like 200 developers and five UX people or something like that, and it's just totally... And then they're surprised when it doesn't get the results that, you know, it really needs. Yeah. So, um, and, and to make things worse... I think what they do is they take a UX designer and they promote that UX designer into a leadership role where basically it involves completely different skills, right? Mm -hmm. Being a design leader and being a UX designer, very different. You know, if you're a, a UX leader, you're making business cases, reporting success, championing the team's value. You know, developing strategies, navigating politics, dealing with clashing priorities and running a team, right? Thank God, that's a completely different set of skills than you need as a, as a UX designer. And do they provide you with training? Hell no. You know, you're just kind of, oh, you were a good UX designer, so let's promote you out of that job into a completely different one and leave you to it. So it's hardly surprising then that senior management have got a bit disillusioned and started making cuts in this area. So if you are in an in-house team, this is advice for you, right? So you're in an in-house team, you probably this has resonated with you, that you're under-resourced, that you don't really have the training to do the job properly, that you're under increased pressure to demonstrate ROI. So... I, obviously, I can't do the whole workshop with you because we're running late as it is. But here's my advice. Don't accept how other people are defining your role. The chances are you're being pulled into every project that's going on and you'll spread so thinly and you're seen as a bottleneck because there are 20 projects that all these developers and product owners and project managers are wanting to be done. And you've got a tiny team, right? And you can't work on all those projects. It's never going to work, right? So you're going to have to redefine your role and set your own agenda um, and direction. So instead of um, like working within um, a, a, a kind of team, uh, sorry, working as uh, on all of those projects, you're going to need to start work, working strategically. So 
focus on setting standards, creating resources that can help people, acting as an internal consultant um, for these teams and training these teams on how to do their own UX because you don't have enough resources to do it yourself, right? I'd say you even need to be feisty about it as well, certainly early on, about yeah. what your role is. You know, remind people regularly what your role is and even throw your teddies out of the pram a bit if you have to. Um, yeah. Because it will get you respect in the end. You might, you might be seeing yeah. it difficult, but if it's about things that are to do with better processes and things like that, no one can argue with you. Um, you know, no. you want to be more efficient. So I'm, I'm losing my shit because I want to be more efficient. Then yeah. it's, you, you, people can't argue with that. So that would be my advice. So, so, yeah, start creating, you know, strategy documents of, you know, this is what I should be doing compared to what I am doing, you know, uh, and start implementing standards, start working on resources and don't ask for permission to do this shit. Just do it. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission anyway. And don't wait for people to tell you, you know, how to do your job or let them tell you how to do your job because they don't bloody know is the truth. A senior manager doesn't know how to make UX successful. That's why they hired you. Um, I would encourage you to make some strategic allies, make a point of going out and finding people in the organization that get UX and appreciate UX um, and, and, you know, really lean into those relationships um, uh, and almost become indispensable to those people. Give them extra help than you would give other people help to, in order to really get them over. And here's another crucial piece of advice that I think UX teams are shit at, which is invest significant energy in not doing work, but in actively promoting your impact in the organization, right? You, you know, the most successful teams in organizations are those that really know how to sell themselves, right? That are really pushing out to the rest of the organization. They're providing resources, they're providing training, they're setting standards and policies and procedures, all of these kinds of stuff. Now, if you work for a younger organization that maybe is not an industry leader in your field, then focus on the potential that UX has, right? Talk all the time about how UX can help grab market share, how UX can help, you know, um, uh, reach new audiences and those kinds of things. If you work for a traditional organization, like, for example, I'm working with Oxford University at the moment, and you can't get more traditional than that, that's well-established and deeply rooted in the organization, then focus on the threats, Focus on, dam you know, if you don't do good UX, it's going to damage your reputation. It's going to lead to higher student turnover. It's going to lead, you know, blah, blah, blah. Focus on the negatives um, in order to say it. Um, don't bother, although I agree with Marcus's comment about, you know, being really feisty, um, that don't let that just turn into complaining and moaning, right? Oh, no. So, yeah. That the because that just really pisses people off. Don't go to management and say things like we're under resourced, right? Um, you know, I need more people. Give me more people. They hear that shit all the time, and it doesn't impress them or doesn't impact them. Instead, you go to them not with a problem but with a solution. I know that sounds so trite, but <laughs> it, it really is true. Right. So you go to them and say, as we are under resourced, which I entirely understand, we will now need to work in this way. Right. Where we're not drawn into every project because we just don't have enough people. But instead, we're going to look at being strategic. We're going to look at setting standards. We're going to look at providing resources and training so that everybody can um, uh, do it. Now, one of the things that you'll probably you'll find is that obviously this isn't how you have been right? Um, so far. So there's inertia against you in the organization, right? So if that is the case, then um, first of all, try and find yourself a, an executive sponsor to so someone quite senior who gets it, right? Sell the idea, not into everybody, but into one person. Ideally, your line manager, but if you can't, if, if that person is resistant, that's fine. Go to one of their peers or even one of their supervisors, right? You know, none of the, just, you're going to have to play a bit of politics here. 
try and win over that one person. If that doesn't work, or even if that does work, actually, then the next step is to, to relaunch your team, okay? And, and do a big kind of push in the organization of we're relaunching. We're no longer the UX team. We're the UX center of excellence, right? Or that, that's always a great thing to shove on the end of it because companies like centers of excellence. Um, and, and it shifts you away from being a service t department that is just implementing other people's ideas to being a center of excellence, a place where you go if you want expertise in UX and advice like that. Yeah, I just, I, I guess what I was trying to do in this session is just really encourage you that there, that, you know, you don't need to be stuck in this rut of, you know, being a bottleneck, you know, working on projects that you don't get enough time working on, feeling like you're, you know, you're constantly being, people are demanding that you je uh, justify your ROI. You know, take control of your team and get aggressive about it right? And push. Um, now, I know that's hard to do. So I would encourage you as well to look some external support on this, right? So that might be to get yourself a bit of coaching. It might be to get yourself a bit of training. Find yourself a com you know, community of design leaders. Just find other people that are in a similar position to you and, and, and maybe start a call with them regularly where you're, you're encouraging one another and supporting one another in this. Because being a design leader is a very isolating job that you've not been trained properly for. You are having to make up as you go along, right? And you might be doing really well, and that's, that's great. But a lot of people are really struggling with it. And I think to get an outside perspective is, is massively helpful as well. So that's my, my, me trying to be encouraging again. The thing I struggle the most with is, is this idea of, of going from being a service team to this center of excellence kind of thing because the work doesn't go away you still are no. you still need to provide a service like an agency like the like headscape provides a service i don't i i kind of know what you're saying i kind of disagree as well well right okay we can't agree can on I, everything paul no, no, <laughs> can I, but, but let me push back let's use the agency example it would be the equivalent of headscape shifting from being a you give us a brief, we'll build your website to uh, we're going to be a consultant and training house that teaches you how to do it yourself, right? That's the fundamental shift that I'm talking about when I talk about going from a service department to a center of excellence. The, the truth is there is not enough UX professionals to work on every project that's available, right? So all you can do is accept that reality, right? Because you're not going to suddenly triple or quadruple the size of your team. So you accept that reality and say, well, okay, we can't do it because there's not enough of us to do it. So now we're going to teach you how to do it, right? So, so if that mental shift, and in terms of the work doesn't go away, obviously you need to finish projects that you're already engaged with, right? But you need to start pushing back on new projects as they come in and say, well, we're shifting to being a center of excellence. I'm happy to provide you with training. I'm happy to give you resources. I'm happy to act as a consultant for you that explains how things are operating. I've got a preferred supplier list of people you can bring in from the outside if you really don't have the time to do it yourself. But you know what? You, you can do this. I can teach you how to do this, right? That's got to be the new mindset. In mo at least that's how I'm kind of approaching it increasingly. Does that does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. I think that the the real world is somewhere between the two, and that you would end up providing less actual time to a project, or there'll be a really important project. You know, the fiftieth anniversary project comes along, so yes. we need you guys. You know, and it's, yeah. it's it's just not as clear cut. I suppose that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and I do agree with that. I mean, you know, and I think it's also, I'm not saying you don't run any services, but, but like, for example, Super that I was talking about, yeah, I'm going to get this acronym to catch on if it kills mm, me. Okay. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> shut up. <laughs> this idea of running a Super at the beginning of a project where you help to define whether that project is actually worth doing from a user experience point of view, that could be a service. But it's when you, when a designer gets, uh, when a UX team gets stuck in, uh, 
oh, can you mock up this user interface? Oh, no, I don't like the colour. And can you... That level of project engagement is basically just a pixel pusher. And I think a lot of UX teams are basically pixel pushers with a bit of testing slapped on the end. And and I'm trying to move the team. And I don't, you know, and I'm not, I'm not arguing with, with the, with, with, you know, the, the underlying premise of what you're trying to do here. I think it's bang on, but I think real world is the people that, if you're saying, okay, we're going to teach you how to do it. We don't want to be trusting other people to be pixel pushers, do we? Um, but all right, hire other people, like agencies, like Headscape. Um, yeah, yeah, this is it's basically a big <laughs> ad for Headscape. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we, uh, well, you, yeah, yeah I, and I do agree with you that, that, and this is one of the things that I think a lot of UX teams struggle with. The quality will go down, mm. right? For those projects that the UX team has been uh, actually actively engaged on, but think about all of those projects previously where you didn't really get to touch it at all, right? Mm. So let's say you've got 50 projects happening and you've got five UX designers, right? What's your choices there? You could work on five UX projects and do it great, or and but then 45 get no attention, right? And are just a train wreck. Or... You could spend, you could spread your five designers across 50 projects and do a pretty shit job on all of them, right? Or you could go, I'm going to teach everybody how to do a little bit better, right? To start understanding the value of UX, to start implementing basic UX practices. Now, it, the result won't be as good as those five if you, you know, if you just concentrated on those five projects. But it'll probably be better than the foot. Well, it will be better than the 45 that had no attention. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. But I think ultimately the, the disagreement between you and me is that I don't live in the real world. So, <laughs> you know, I don't care about pragmatics. I live is, in BOAG world. This is indeed, indeed, but this is a slight tangent, but I've looked at two. Uh, university sites, and I'm not going to name them, although one of them was one we worked on, that I've just, I've just noticed have got new designs. And they're yeah. shocking, just yeah. awful. And one of them, and this is not the one that we worked on, is basically, and this this is for Andy Clark. I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna do another podcast with Andy soon, aren't we? And I'm gonna get him yeah. to look at this site to say, look, that is a coloured in wireframe. I've been saying it for years. Yeah. The likes of me should not be doing design. I should be gathering yeah. the information to give to a designer who knows what they're doing. And it's just. It's basically someone's done it in, in balsamic or something something and coloured oh. it in brown. And it's just yeah. shit. And stop it, basically. You know, hire, hire people who know what they're doing or employ people who know what they're doing from a design perspective. Yeah, see, and this is where I think we've... This is where I think we've swapped roles a bit. That I think maybe you're being a bit idealistic and I'm being a bit more pragmatic because m my argument is... You're not going to change these companies out the gate. They're, su they're not suddenly going to have money. No, but these to are hire flagship an websites for universities that were really good previously, and now they're right, shit. Right. And it's like right. you just want to have a rant. I'll let you have <laughs> yeah. a rant. That's really fine. do want about one of them. It's like man. But anyway, move on. We've, we're running yeah. out of time. What's next, Paul? Yes, interesting read. So just want to throw a three interesting reads in your uh, direction, two of which are just passing comments. The third I'm a bit more interested in. Um, I, I read a really good article on workshops recently, and it, it just said something. It, uh, it just resonated with me. I mean, this will be in the show notes. Obviously, you can go and read it yourself. But it, it resonated with me because the basically the the one thing in the article I picked up on is you don't always have to do the thing that everybody says you do, right? So so it's an article really about workshops, mm -hmm. okay? But it's got a whole section to dedicate it to when you don't really need to run a workshop, right? Which I loved. I loved it because so often it's like, um, uh, you know, people are going, oh, oh, we do a discovery workshop. That's part of our process. But it's not always relevant. No, right? absolutely. And, and, and they're, the real, they're the worst meetings, aren't they? When we're going oh, through the agenda it, that you've copied from the last workshop that you did, yeah. thinking, this doesn't really apply here. 
And everyone just looks at each other. This is pointless. Yeah. And you're wasting people's time, you know? Yeah. And and, and the I have this fight all the time in the agency academy that I run, right? All these, they're, they're, they're constantly, everybody, and everybody's like it. They're going, oh, Paul, can we talk about processes? You know, what's our process? What is the step? I need a checklist where I tick off everything I do, every project. And I keep going, no, no, mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. Every project's slightly different. Clients are different. What you're delivering is different. Think of it as a toolkit, right? Workshops are a tool in your toolkit. And you take that workshop tool out when it's appropriate, mm. right? But sometimes it won't be. And it's like... A Andy Budd wrote, a, wrote an article years ago that I've mentioned a couple of times. I think I even, it's a long time ago because I think I mentioned it on Old Boag World. <laughs> Um, oh my word! Where he he coined the term "sticky note weary," um, yes, which is and it's like that's the same thing. And basically, sometimes what it really boils down to is just trust your judgment and get on with it. And and I've actually had to kind of realise a little bit lately that we're doing that with some of our existing clients, that we are so in this mindset of we must know exactly what the user wants and what the, these kind, kind of things. And you ask more questions, ask more questions, ask more questions. And actually, yeah. we could have just, you know, just done something and gone, is that all right? And they would have gone, yeah, brilliant. Because that's our clients want us to think for them quite a lot of the time. Yes. That is our role. So rather, yes, yeah. of course we need to ask questions and we don't just do what the hell we like. But sometimes it goes too far. And that's what I think what we're yes. talking about here. You know, just remember that actually you're a skilled designer. You know, not, I don't mean just necessarily with you know visuals, but we, we build things. We, we're creators. So create. And it, it, it's a lack of confidence in your own abilities mm. is the reason why you want a process. Mm. And you want this, you know, we must do our workshop on this, etc. It's because it's like a safety net for you. Mm. Um, but, you know... There are occasions when you want to go, do you know what? The best way of solving this is let's, let me go away and I'll quickly prototype my vision in my head, right? That. You might, and, and when you look at it, you might go, that's wonderful. Or you might go, no, that's totally not what I had in my head. And that's okay. Not everything needs to be solved with a three-hour workshop where you go through set exercises. Anyway, no, well, we're, we're in agreement. We really are turning it. We're, we're in agreement and we're really, forcing each other's grumpiness so uh, let's move on although this next one is going to be just as bad this is an article written by um uh, dan mole and it's about how designers and developers should work together and they, he calls it the hot potato process right so what he's pushing back against he's being grumpy not us although i agree with him mm. he's pushing back against the thing designer goes and does their thing hands it across to the developer the developer does their thing right and He's saying, no, 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 it shouldn't be like that. It should be like a hot potato where it's getting constantly back and forth, back and forth between designer and developer. And that, that working relationship is so important. And the reason that I included that in here is because the minute I read that article, I thought about Ed and Dan, right, from the Headscape. It's more Dan and Lee, really, but basically Headscape does the hot potato. Because yeah, it really does. Because Dan is feisty and says, "I'm making design decisions and I shouldn't be." Yeah. Back to you, designer. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then there's this kind of constant back, and it's just normal now. Um, but it's not because because what happens, you know, you're never going to. Well, you, you should, never's too strong, but you'd be unlikely to consider every design decision of an interactive interface when you're yeah. at, in Photoshop. Or Figma, whatever. So, some Photoshop, bloody hell. So, so, get Marcus. Ed still uses it. I know. And <laughs> Ed needs to get with, with it as well. Uses he Figma needs a as slap. Well. He uses Figma as well. Anyway, yeah. okay. you're, 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 you're doing design work. You're, somebody needs to interpret that design into the front end code. And it's like, well, yeah. that probably shouldn't be not, the designer shouldn't not have a part of that. And that's what this is yeah, saying. Yeah. saying. So, yeah, yeah, of course, you shouldn't be just do a load of design work. There you go. Bye. But it goes the other way. The reason I said Ed and Dan is because I remember a very specific instance that stuck in my mind when I, one of the rare times I was in the office. And Ed and Dan almost sat back to back with one another at this particular point, right? And 
I remember Dan turning around one day and looking over Ed's shoulder and say, say to Ed, if you do that, I'll slap you. Right? Because it, he was basically um, trying to create something. Uh, uh, Ed was proposing something that would have been really difficult to code. Yeah, yeah. And is that interaction, that back and forth, when you get a good designer and developer working together, it is magic. Mm. It is magic. And I do think Headscape have always had that very well. Um, and, and so, yeah, just don't stop handing off to developers, you know, Take the time to build good working relationships for your developers. It is utterly, utterly worth it. Agree. Anyway, the very final article that I wanted to mention is um, Unbounce. The people that do landing pages um, have released a what they could call a conversion benchmark report. Um, and it's basically they've, because obviously they host thousands and thousands of landing pages. Um, and so what they've done is they've used data to analyze all those landing pages, look at the conversion rate, look at common char characteristics between different conversion rates. Really interesting findings in it. But the, the one that, um, uh, well, there were two things that jumped out from me. The first was that um, attention span has dropped from 2 minutes and 12 seconds in 2012 to 47 seconds today, right? In terms of how long someone is going to spend on a web page, right? And so this correlated brilliantly with um, content and the reading level of content, okay? So uh, one of the biggest problems is, is that the amount of content that's written online, that's written at a professional level, right? Um, and... So, it's, so you're talking about reading level of 16 or, or above or thereabouts, right? And um, that is really hard for people to read, okay? Even if you are like a postgraduate or an academic or whatever else, you are going to be significantly slowed down reading that kind of copy and understanding it, and you're going to take in less of information. So here is the key fact, right? A landing page that is written at fifth to seventh grade reading level converts at twice the rate of something that is written at a postgraduate level. Now, I've always kind of known this and I've always said, well, if you write for eighth or ninth grade reading level, that's about right. Okay. But if you can reduce it from say ninth grade to seventh grade, you will see a, a conversion rate go up anywhere between 11% and 50%, right? Reading level is so, so important, and yet it's normally shit because people don't hire professional uh, writers to write their copy. They think they can do it themselves, and then they blame the designer when their conversion rate is low. So, yes, a little rant on that one. Yeah, or... You could be um, cynical about it and say that Unbounce picked out all the stuff that would help them sell more of their products. Just saying. Well, it wouldn't, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would agree with you normally, but they don't create the content. No, but they, they, they don't make they would any have money off the content and, and, and pulled the recommendations out and created the this is the interesting stuff from the data that we have gleaned. So you think they just made up data? <laughs> no, 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 you no. Are no. Such a no, bloody they've got silly. data, but you know, but you, you, we've all done it. We've gone, oh, that helps me make the point I want to make. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I've picked this article out because it makes the point I want to make. But, but from their perspective, there's no benefit of making that point. Yeah, um, what's the benefit to them of making that point? Uh, people will go. We've got. We, we need. We need. We. I don't know. They need their services. I don't even know what their services are, Paul. But uh, yeah, their uh, services don't include content. That's my point. Uh, I would question some of the other stuff, right? That you know, because well, they, they throw a few true in things in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think this is one of the true things that they've thrown in. Is my point. Also, I think. I have I have an issue, and this is I, and I can't really argue it, but I'm going to anyway. With the the reading age thing, I think it's a, I think right. it's more about quality writing. So what you were saying about there's rubbish content out there, and people should be investing in good content. I agree. The reading age thing, 
I'm. It depends on. It depends. It depends on what it is you're trying to do, or trying to get across, or trying to sell. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know? obviously, we're talking here specifically about landing pages for a start. Yeah. Right. So, so you know, there is other content on the web. You know, if you're publishing a a, a postgraduate thesis, <laughs> right, on the web, of course, you don't need to make it a reading level of seventh grade in that case. But for for copy when you're trying to sell something, then this stands up. And it stands up for, for a couple of reasons, right? One is that um, there is research that categorically shows that the um, higher the reading level, the longer it takes someone to read that copy and to process that copy, and also the, the less of that copy they retain in their memory. Whether or not you're, you know, super well educated or not this is not saying that people are thick it's saying that people only read 20 to 28 percent of the copy on the page so they're scanning it and if copy is uh, written at a higher reading level it's harder to scan and so they retain less information right so that reduces the chance of them buying simple as that then you add into that that some people are reading this copy in their second language add to that that some people have got reading difficulties like dyslexia all of uh, some people are new to the sector that you're you're targeting, and so some of the terminology might not be familiar to them. All of these things combined means that ultimately, the higher the reading level, the less your conversion rate is going to be when it comes to sales copy. Right? I'll give you that. And one. I'm not having I'm not having dissent on that, Marcus. I'm digging in because you had no evidence to back up your position whatsoever. You were pulling it out your ass. <laughs> you don't really you don't really agree with me even though i present as a compelling argument no i kind of do because you know you've known me long enough to know that i can sound very convincing with my bullshit it's it's a life skill that's very important right marcus yes joke time joke time <sighs> a man goes to his doctor and says uh, doctor i think i'm losing my hearing the doctor says can you describe the symptoms to me the man says, sure, Homer's fat and bald and Marge has tall blue hair. <laughs> Unfortunately, I accidentally went into the Slack ch uh, joke channel. So I had seen that one. I need to stop doing yeah, that. because do. um, Some of them I find in there, some of them I find from elsewhere, but there will be ones from the Slack joke channel. Yeah, so I need to not look at that. I did like that one, actually. Indeed. That did make me laugh. So that's good. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us um, in this rather long show today. Um, I hope it was useful and that you feel a bit more encouraged, whether you're a design leader, whether you're somebody struggling to find a job at the moment, or you're an agency that's struggling. Be encouraged. Life doesn't suck as much as maybe it feels like it sometimes. And with <laughs> on that positive <laughs> note, we'll say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. 